Good day and thank you for standing by. Welcome to the Ferrari 2022 Q1 results conference call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the speaker presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask the question during the session, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone. Please be advised that today's conference is being recorded. If you require assistance during the conference, please press star 0. I would now like to hand over the conference to your first speaker today, Nicoletta Russo. Nicoletta, please go ahead. Thank you, Stephen, and welcome to everyone who is joining us. Today, we plan to cover the group's Q1 2022 uh, operating results, and the duration of the call is expected to be around 60 minutes. Today's call will be offered by the group. CEO, Mr. Benedetto Vigna, and Group CFO, Mr. Antonio Piccapiccon. All relevant materials are available in the investor section of the Ferrari corporate website. And at the end of the presentation, we will be available to answer your questions. Before we begin, let me remind you that any forward-looking statements we might make during today's call are subject to the risk and uncertainties mentioned in the safe harbor statement included on page two of today's presentation, and the call will be governed by this language. With that said, I'd like to turn the call over to Benedetto. Grazie, Nicoletta. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I would like to start by thanking all the women, all the men in Ferrari, for their passion and dedication, which has been essential to navigate the first months of this year. All of them contributed with their tireless effort in achieving the strong result that we are going to present today. Before addressing our result for the first quarter of 22, I would like to spend a few words on the current international scenario and ongoing conflict in Ukraine. While hoping for a rapid return to dialogue and a peaceful resolution, our thoughts and support go out to those affected. Ferrari is playing its small part alongside the institution to bring relief to this situation. In relation to this ongoing crisis and its implication, our supply chain has continued to prove its resilience, guaranteeing a smooth production at our facilities. We have no doubt the current macroeconomic scenario is causing a new challenge. However, our team in Ferrari, also with the support of our partners, have been able to manage this situation properly. That said, while we continue to monitor the current scenario on our supply chain, we have not been immune to inflation. However, this is limited to a portion of our cost base. In fact, we have seen some increase in energy and certain raw material costs, mainly aluminum and precious metals. But in light of this, we immediately took two actions to preserve our profitability. The first, in fall last year, we applied a price increase across our current product range. The second, we just set the price positioning of our new models to adequately reflect our estimates on cost inflation. At the beginning of the year, we announced the new organizational structures achieved through both the promotion of homegrown talent and a number of key strategic external hires. The new organization is designed to further foster innovation, optimize processes, enhance agility, and increase collaboration being open and more horizontal. And I'm very much delighted to see that we are on the right transformation path. Moving to the first quarter result, I'm very pleased to highlight the following four record quarterly data. The first, the revenues at 1.2 billion euro, up 17% versus the prior year. ABDA, at 423 million euro. Industrial free cash flow generation was approximately 300 million euro, almost twice compared to what we achieved a year ago, sustained by the strong profitability and the advances collected on the Daytona SP3. 
our order book continues to be very strong, much stronger than ever, and it covers very well into 2023. I'm proud to state that most of our models are already sold out, and this is not just for the limited series. All of this was made possible thanks to the following three elements. Number one, our product offer is truly astonishing and now includes V8 and V12 thermal engine as well as V8 and V6 hybrid solution, further enriched by the recent unveil of the 296 GTS. Number two, the strength of our net order intake that continued over the quarter. Number three, the exceptionally strong performance of the pre-owned business sustained by the economic climate. As part of our recent activities, I would also like to underline the following three key facts. Let's start with the signature of the Memorandum of Understanding with the Italian Ministry of Economic Development in Vitalia and the Emilia-Romagna region. This agreement will focus on industrial projects and research and development activities for new technologies aimed at bringing tangible benefit from an environmental perspective, as well as increasing digitalization. Such projects will further foster our competitive advantage since they will ensure the vertical integration of key components to be handcrafted here in Maranello. The plan will lead to the employment of 250 new hires, further boosting the territory of Maranello and Modena as a hub for excellence and increasingly attractive to new skill sets required by the automotive industry. Secondly, the Daytona SP3 was awarded with the red dot best of the best. This international award once again is a testament to the passionate work of all the Ferrari team. And finally, the annual general meeting approved a dividend distribution of approximately 250 million euro, representing a 57% increase of the dividend paid per share compared to the prior year. This is combined with our ongoing multi-year share repurchase program to reward our shareholders. Now, let's move to the product excellence and customer activities. In the last few months, we have continued our engagement activities with clients and the media with the 296 GTB, a model that is receiving unanimous praise giving the utmost level of fun-to-drive experience coupled with our innovative V6 hybrid engine. Evidence of such success is the robust order collection, a record level in a quarter if compared to any other model, and it paves the way for the recently unveiled 296 GTS, its spider version. The 296 GTS marks a further step in our electrification journey and reaches our hybrid offering, now made up of four different models and covering differentiated needs of our customer base. This latest product launch is the fifth cornerstone on our electrification path after La Ferrari, SF90 Stradale, SF90 Spider and 296 GTB. Moreover, with the launch of the 296 GTS, we are just one step away from completing the 15 models promised at the 2018 Capital Market Day. And this leads me to the last, but not least, launch, the highly coveted and much anticipated Puro Sangue, a unique and uncompromising Ferrari. At its earth beats the most iconic Ferrari engine of all time, our naturally aspirated V12, 
celebrating the bloodline of performance, innovation, and excellence. I can testify to its outstanding driving experience while I was driving it on the hills here close to Maranello. It has the agility and the fun to drive typical of our sport cars, believe me. What also thrills me is seeing the Formula One racing team competing back at the top, thanks to our talented drivers and F175, which has proved itself to be reliable and up for the highest challenge. It is mine and the whole team greatest satisfaction to see our hard work starting to pay off. In GT racing, we are consolidating the great performance of last year with several victories already achieved. Important to underline that the motorsport season has just begun and we will continue to fight race by race with ambition and humility. Attention to details, focus and continuous learning will be key as the season unfolds. We are also on track for our return in FIA WC top class from 2023 that will have its highlight in the Le Mans 24 hours, a race where so many great chapters in our motor racing history have been played out. It is a competition that represents another opportunity for us to fight at the highest level while pushing the boundaries of technology on the track to then transfer it to the next generation of Ferrari road car. Moving to the brand diversification activities, in February, we hosted the second fashion show during the Milan Fashion Week, presented our new Ferrari Fall Winter Collection, which received international acclaim. Lastly, I look forward to meeting you in person here in Maranello on June 16, when we will open the doors of our company to analysts, investors, and journalists to present the industrial plan for the coming years. The Capital Market Day will allow us the opportunity to articulate our constant drive for innovation, for exclusivity, and for excellence. In June, we will share with all attendants our future strategy well grounded on a solid plan. I will now hand over to Antonio, who will receive, review the Q1-22 result. Thank you, Benedetto, and good morning or afternoon to everyone joining us today. Let's start on page seven with the highlights of this first quarter. A very strong start, actually, to the year, with two or even three-digit growth for all our KPIs. Shipments were 3,251 units, up more than 17% versus prior year. Group net revenues were 1 billion and 186 million euro, up the same versus prior year. EBDA reached 423 million euro, up 12.5% year over year, with an EBDA margin of 35.6%. This was lower compared to the extraordinary highs of last year since the exceptionally strong product mix of Q1-21 in terms of gross margin, recovery from 2020, was further emphasized by still restrained costs. EBIT was 307 million euro, up 15.4% year over year. Net profit came in at 239 million euro, up 16.4% versus prior year, resulting in a diluted EPS of 1 euro 29 cents compared to 1 euro and 11 cents in Q1 21. The industrial free cash flow generation for the quarter was strong at 299 million euro, supported by the collection of the advances for the Daytona SP3 and the A12 Competizione A. Turning to page eight, you can see the details of the Q1 shipments. 
From now on, we'll show the breakdown of our shipments into ice and hybrids. As we already noted, that the previous split, based on the number of cylinders, has become less and less meaningful. The product portfolio in the quarter included eight thermal engine models and two hybrids, representing 83 and 17 percent of total shipments, respectively. As per our programs, our hybrid offer will be further enriched by the start of deliveries of the 296 GTB in the second quarter, while we continue to serve the impressive order book recorded for all our current range, including certain ICE models whose life cycle has been extended. Deliveries in the quarter were driven by the Ferrari Roma, the SF90 family, as well as the Portofino M. In the quarter, we also commenced the first delivery of the A12 Competizione, while those of the Ferrari Monza SP1 and SP2 were lower than the prior year and reached the end of the limited series run. Quarterly shipments reflected the deliberate geographical location in response to port congestion experienced in the first months of the year, which explains the decrease of our deliveries to America. On page nine, you can see the walk of our group revenues. At constant currency, they grew by 16.6%. Revenues from cars and spare parts were up 18% net of the different exchange rates, driven by volumes, positive product mix and pricing, together with the contribution from personalizations. Revenues from personalizations were higher than the prior year in absolute terms, sustained by volumes, while substantially in line, around 17%, in proportion to revenues from cars and spare parts. Engine revenues were down 19%, given the lower shipments to Maserati, whose contract is approaching the expiration in 2023. The increase in sponsorship, commercial and brand, up more than 17% at cost and currency, was essentially attributable to the better prior year Formula One ranking and the contribution from brand-related activities. This was partially offset by lower sponsorship. Other revenues were mainly related to other supporting activities. Currency, including translation and transaction impact, as well as foreign currency edges, had a total positive contribution of 8 million euro mostly related to the U.S. dollar and the Chinese yuan. As we move to page 10, let me review the change in our EBIT bridge, explained by the following variances. Volume was positive for 59 million euro, reflecting the shipment increase. Mixed price variance was also positive in absolute terms for 13 million euro, driven by the product mix, supported by the SF90 family and personalizations. This was just partly offset by the increased weight of the Portofino M and the Ferrari Roma, as well as the lower contribution of the Ferrari Monza. Please remind that we expect the product mix variance to become negative as the year unfolds, given the phase out of the Monza in Q1 and the phase in of the Daytona SP3 in 2023. Industrial and R&D expenses grew 18 million euro in the quarter due to energy and some material cost increases, as anticipated by Benedetto, as well as higher depreciation and amortization. SDNA were negative by 14 million euro, mainly reflecting definitely more lively communication and marketing activities and our lifestyle events, as well as the company organizational development. Other was substantially flat, in essence, this reflects the better prior year Formula One ranking and higher contribution from brand-related and other supporting activities, offset by lower sponsorship, reduced engine shipments to Maserati, and various other expenses also accrued on the basis of current year ranking. The total net impact of currency was positive for 2 million euro. As a result of what I just mentioned, EBIT reached 307 million euro, up 15.4% versus the prior year, with an EBIT margin of 25.9%.
Turning to page 11, the remarkable industrial free cash flow generation of this quarter, determined by the strong profitability and the already mentioned advances on the Daytona SP3 and the A12 Competition A, within our wider definition of working capital, was offset only in part by the inventory increase related to the project volume growth for the year, as well as by capital expenditure of 132 million euro. The pace of spending is in line with our plans to contain CapEx at around 800 million euro in 2022. In the quarter, the capitalization ratio of our development expenses was approximately 38% in line with the prior year. Net industrial debt as of the end of March 22 was 136 million euro compared to 297 million euro at December 2021 barely reflecting the significant free cash flow net of 135 million euro paid in the context of our share repurchase program. As anticipated by Benedetto, the annual general meeting approved the dividend distribution of approximately 250 million euro to be paid in a couple of days on May 6. On page 12, we confirmed the guidance for 2022, which firmly targets solid growth on all metrics, and robust cash generation amidst all the challenges that this dramatic start of the year is posing in several respects. I think this completes our review for the quarter. As usual, I thank you for listening and very much look forward to seeing you soon in Maranello at our Capital Markets Day. I now turn the call over to Nicoletta. Thank you, Antonio. We are now ready to start the Q&A session. Steven, I'll turn the call over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Nicoletta. As a reminder, a reminder to ask a question, you will need to press star zero on your telephone. To withdraw your question, please, please press the pound or hash, sign, the hash key. Please stand by while I recompile the Q&A roster. The first question comes from Giulio Pescatova from BMPP. Please go ahead, sir. Hi, thanks for taking my question. The first one on the guidance, one very simple question. Your target range implies an EBIT margin of about 23%, even at the higher end in the next nine months. Isn't that slightly too conservative despite the higher R&D and weakening mix? Um, then the second question on, on the Monza, I just want to make sure I understood it correctly. You, can you confirm that there are no more Monza due for deliveries in Q2? It was completely phased out in Q1. Uh, and then the last one on the poor of sangue, thanks for the extra color on the, on the engine, the V12 engine. Uh, but can you maybe give us your reasoning behind the decision to launch the poor of sangue without a hybrid system, uh, also given that this is a model that uh, we had hoped that uh, would improve your position in China? Um, yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, Giulio. I start with the second question, and then uh, uh, Antonio will comment on the first one. So the, the Puro Sangue will be a natural aspirated V12, our iconic model. We have been testing uh, different options, but then I think it was clear that uh, to celebrate the, the, the bloodline of the performance, innovation, experience, the, the V12, and the, the experience and the product performance it is, able to, it is able to deliver has been the right uh, solution to push to the market. So there has been a clear uh, result of our testing and also our discussion with the, with the market. For the month, I can uh, uh, reaffirm what uh, Antonio said, that we stopped the production and the sales of uh, Monza in, uh, in Q1. For the other part of the question, Antonio, you may help on this direction. Yeah. Hi, Giulio. The guidance that we provided on EBIT is based on the fact that DNA will accrue over the course of the, over the, course of the year, not linearly, but based on, on the start of production of our new model. So it's basically growing uh, during the course of the year. Okay, and so to follow up on the guidance, uh, we also saw the U.S. dollar appreciating quite significantly. Uh, is that already reflected in the, in the guidance you have? Um, yeah, um, the reason why we, we have 
we are not basically making significant changes as, because, you, as you know, we are following a foreign exchange um, hedging policy. So there might be opportunities around that, depending on how much remains free from hedging. But we prefer to, to stay cautious on that because it's unpredictable what happens to the currencies. Understood. Thank you. I'll see you soon. And, and the next question comes from Martino Oti Ambrogi from Equitar. Thank you very much. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, the first is on, uh, always on the, on the guidance. Uh, if I take your uh, volumes in, uh, in Q1 and then multiply by, by 4, which is quite usual, let's say, in normal years uh, in the past, uh, I get something in the region of uh, 13,000 units. Uh, so first question, is it reasonable, uh, uh, this figure as at the underlying volumes uh, in, in your full year guidance? Hi, Martino. Maybe I take this one. Um, as you know, we do not comment on, comment on shipments. I think our revenues is really what is driving our results, so we are focusing on that one. We'll, we may add that, obviously, due to the significant order book, um, shipments will remain high over the course of the year. Yes. Okay. The second part of, of, of the question, even if it's not 13,000 in any case, uh, it is a significant uh, growth uh, uh, for uh, just one year. Um, and if I remember correctly, your output capacity is uh, 15, 16,000. So if you maintain the same pace, also knowing that uh, the puro sangue will, uh, will be all additional, uh, we don't know the amount of volumes, but uh, will be additional, so probably you have another two, three years' time uh, before uh, needing to either add a shift uh, or at capacity, uh, just to know what, uh, what you're uh, thinking about it. It's a good question, Martino, thank you. I think uh, um, you, will, uh, you will have a clear answer to all your deductions, let's say the 16th of June. What I can tell you is uh, that uh, also for all the cars we make, we will keep uh, clear in mind uh, the exclusivity. You remember well the capacity that we have is in that ballpark. I can tell you that we are not planning investment to take uh, to, to increase that uh, that numbers. Okay, and uh, the last question is a more specific question on prices. Uh, during your uh, introduction remarks, uh, you mentioned that uh, you already uh, revised upward prices last year in order to offset uh, raw material and uh, other cost uh, inflation. Uh, and uh, you are also revising prices this year. Could you uh, provide us just a rough indication of uh, the amount of uh, price revision? The, the price increase that has been already applied is in the range of 2%. This is already, I mean, uh, delivered to the market. It's on the process. Some, some results already in Q1, some others are coming. Okay, so I was wrong in understanding there was one last year and another one coming. No, no, you are right. I mean, there are two things. There are the, 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 the model that have been already, the, the old model, let me say, and the new model. The old model is the price increase uh, ballpark I gave you. For the new model, there is a different price increase that is, uh, let me say, different from the 2%. Two, uh, two so you understood well. Is we are talking yeah. about two different things. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. And the next question comes from Susie Tipaldi from UBS. Please go ahead, ma'am. Thank you for taking my question. So my first one would be on the demand, which you already indicated continues to be extremely strong. Your uh, order books are a record highs, um, but can you just give us some more comments qualitatively? I mean, are you really not seeing any impact from uh, all the macro pressures that we are seeing? So um, maybe by geography, is there anything at all um, that maybe worth flagging, or um, is this high-end consumer really 
spending the same as before or even more. Um, and then my second question would be on, um, on China. Uh, we saw a strong increase in volumes in China which is said to be um, in line with the demand there. Uh, I was wondering w which models are seeing the most success um, in China. And, um, and when it comes to the Chinese market, is, it, is this demand concentrated in few uh, key areas? Or how, how do you see um, that? It would be very interesting to get some color. Thank you. OK, I start from the second, uh, Susie. So in China, we, see, uh, we have very good attraction on the eight cylinders, ice, and hybrid. So I think this is uh, really the, the, a good summary of what we see in, uh, in China. When it comes uh, instead to the, the trend of the demand, I mean, cl clearly we are watching carefully. We expect uh, a different pattern also because uh, we basically, most of uh, several models are sold out. I'm talking about the F8, I'm talking about the Portofino, about H12. So, we expect a different pattern also because uh, we deliberately selected to sold out and to terminate some models. Okay, understood. Thanks. And the next question comes from George Gallias from Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead, sir. Yeah, thank you for taking my questions. Um, the first question is on the Pura Sangue again. So very excited to see this, and thank you for the incremental details. When you think about the pricing of the Pura Sangue and its exclusivity, obviously if we look at some of the other high-end utility vehicles in the market, we're seeing huge wait lists and cars being sold on very quickly in the second-hand market at very large premiums. So when you think about the pricing of the Pura Sangue, do you plan to price it at a level where Ferrari is the main beneficiary for the strong demand rather than sellers in the used car market? And are you also taking any additional measures to control which customers are prioritized on the product? The second question I had was just on the deposits. I don't know if you could confirm what percent of deposits on the Competizione A and the Daytona have been taken during the quarter. Thank you. So I start, uh, George, I take the question on the Puro Sangue. Antonio will take the, the first one. So on the Puro Sangue, uh, I would say that uh, clearly we have a price in mind. <laughs> we cannot shave, unfortunately. But uh, uh, we want to preserve always, for, uh, also for, uh, for this car, we, want, we keep in mind the exclusivity. The exclusivity is uh, one strategic guideline we push, we keep pushing, and uh, we want to make sure that uh, this stays well grounded uh, in, uh, in the DNA of all the product uh, we, we, we develop. So ProSanque will also be considered this dimension of exclusivity. In terms of um, as I said, the price and, and, uh, and customer base, we have clear ideas, and uh, let's say we will address properly at the right time. I, instead, for the advance payment, the other question, Antonio, you may help. Yeah, yeah hi, George. Um, the net impact uh, of contribution of the Daytona and the April competition is in the region of 80 million. Obviously, this is a net impact, meaning the cash inflow has been higher than that, um, and half of it is due to the Daytona. And then we have a negative, which is the amount not collected on the Monza because already co collected in the previous year. Um, so it's basically a net between 120 million euro cash in and 30 million uh, less collections on, on the Monza. Hope it, it helps. Great, thank you. And the next question comes from Stefan Whiteman from Society General. Thank you very much. Uh, go ahead, Stefan. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, first of all, um, could you give us the number of Monza SP1, SP2s that were sold in its final quarter uh, for this year? Um, secondly, could you comment a bit about what you said about the order book? You've mentioned very strong orders for the F8 
um, which obviously is in its uh, last on its, on its in its last selling period. When will this be finished relative to the S being replaced by the 296 GTB and obviously the GTS? And finally, on sponsorship for the Formula One team, um, I understand obviously you lost um, or Mission Winnow um, has become like a, a, a co-sponsor, but is no longer the main headline sponsor. Could you comment on what's happening on negotiations for replacing it? And I suspect that given the strong performance of the Formula One team, the negotiations are getting easier in terms of finding a, a main sponsor. Thank you. Okay, so I start from the sponsors, the other way around. So from the sponsor, as we said uh, uh, in, the, in the call, we see that uh, uh, we, we, we have a, a wider set of partners that are uh, willing uh, to, I mean, to work together with us. And uh, uh, this um, basket of partners goes from technology to banks to also new, new players of a new economy. So I would say that we see a positive trend over there and uh, we become more and more appealing uh, as we win more, if you can easily understand, more and more Grand Prix. So if you want, the summary is that it's true that we uh, lost a big, a big sponsor, but it's also true, I mean, the contribution of the big sponsor is not so big like in the past, but it's also true now that we access to a more diversified set of sponsors. And then I comment about the second part, was the order book. The order book for the eight cylinders, the, the, the sport eight cylinder, the F8, goes uh, till end of next year, but we start to see already an overlap with the 296 GTB, that as I said before, is uh, has the highest ever traction in terms of uh, interest, in terms of order book for, uh, from, the, from many customers. Uh, just to complete before uh, ending over to, um, to, to Antonio, basically we have uh, also a strong traction and we are uh, sold out on the, on the 12 cylinder, on the H12, basically for uh, additional two years. The, the key point I would like to leave here is that in Q2, we already start to ship the 296 GTB. Antonio, you yeah. want to comment? Uh, and the last information was the uh, number of Monza sold in Q1, and the number is 40. All right. Thank you. And just sorry, if I can just put in one final one. Also on the Perisangue, do you envisage that the vehicle will only be powered by V12s, or do you think that in the future also it might take alternative, uh, different powertrains as well, with a lower number of cylinders? No, Capito. We do not, we do not comment on this. Sorry. Thank you. We cannot comment. Sorry about this, Stephen. <laughs> Thank you. And the next question comes from Omar Besson from Kepler Chevrolet. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you very much. It's Omar Besson and Kepler Chevrolet. Uh, I also have a couple of questions, please. Uh, firstly, uh, I, I would like to confirm that uh, uh, your uh, first quarter was probably the strongest in terms of uh, profitability and free cash flow for the year. Yes, yes, Omar. This has been record quarter uh, on all key metrics. Yes, you're right. Absolute terms. But it's, it's fair to assume that the next three quarters are, are probably going to be a bit softer because you, you're still going to benefit from volumes, but less from uh, the mix you had uh, in, in Yuan, right? Yeah, this is a fair assumption. This is based on product mix on one end, the fact that we stopped selling the Monza in, at the end of the first quarter with not have yet the Daytona that is coming in 2023. Um, and also in terms of the cash flow, this is due to the, to the pace of collection of the deposit during the course of the year. Very clear. Uh, and obviously the fact that, that capital expenditure is growing uh, and not linearly during the course of the year. Clear. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I wanted to get back to Formula One. Uh, 
if we assume that your current uh, strike continues and that you win the championship, which I think would be great, uh, could you just remind us what would be the impact on your 2023 accounts, uh, broadly speaking, because it would be a, a substantial improvement? Yeah, it will be a positive. I, I can't quantify that one uh, because it's also based on the EVDA uh, of the overall circus. Okay, but we, 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 would you say that this is, would be a substantial double-digit million figure for your 23 EVDA if you manage to win the championship, or, or is it too much? Uh, as I said, prefer not to quantify. No comment. Let's assume it's, it's an improvement anyway, which is, I mean... Okay. Perhaps not material numbers, but still significant one. Thank you. Last quick one, please. Uh, you mentioned in your prepared comment that the pre-owned business was, was very strong. Uh, could you remind us uh, wh where we can see that uh, in, in your accounts, please? Well, actually, you don't see this on our numbers, or you would see it marginally in our financial services business, but really marginally. Um, I think what we witness, what, what, the reason why we monitor it, though, is because it, it's very relevant to support the order intake, obviously, and the interest of a number of customers. Thank you very much. Very clear. Thank you. And the next question comes from Gabriel Adler from City. Please go ahead, sir. Hi, good afternoon. Thanks. There are two questions left on my side. Um, just coming back to free cash flow, you're very clearly running ahead of the run rate implied by the guidance of above 600 million. So could you provide some more color, please, on your expectations for working capital uh, and CapEx through the year and the ramp uh, that you expect to see there? And then secondly, on volumes, I appreciate that you don't specifically guide on this, but I think previously you've commented that the first half should be stronger than the second. Could you confirm whether that's still your expectation for the year? Thank you. Yeah, um, sure, Gabriel. I think the first question in terms of the cash flow, in terms of capital expenditure, that is basically the, the main negative starting from the EBITDA. We expect it to annually grow up to approximately 800 million euro overall figure. Um, the pace of development, though, is not linear during the course of the year. It's more exponential. That adds, of course, in terms of working capital around year end. So we expect also um, working capital, including deposit, to be a positive in, in the year. And the guidance, the overall guidance, is for not less than 600 million euro overall uh, industrial free cash flow. Um, the, the, the second question, forgive me, is on, on volumes. Uh, whether H1 uh, is better than H2, I, I would say. Not necessarily. Uh, it's more in terms of quality uh, because of, uh, of Q1 that includes the, the sales of the, of the Monza. Okay, understood. Thank you very much. Welcome. And the next question comes from Gianluca Bertuzzo, Intermondese. Please go ahead, sir. Hi, everyone, and thank you for taking my question. I have two questions on the Puro Spangue, if I may. Uh, first one, uh, if we look at uh, some of your peers in the luxury uh, industry, uh, they faced uh, cannibalization of their GT models after the launch of their uh, SUV. Uh, do you think uh, uh, this uh, is a risk also for Ferrari, as GT uh, models represent almost one-third of, uh, of your uh, shipments? And the second one, uh, um, do, do you have a certain threshold beyond which uh, uh, you will not go uh, for the SUV in terms of uh, volume compared to your total shipments? Thank you. I start from the second one, uh, Gianluca. Uh, we will, uh, as I said, we will stick uh, to ex exclusive, exclusivity also for the Puro Sangue. Yes, clearly, we, are, uh, we have uh, numbers clear in mind in terms of ratio to total, to total numbers that we want to make as Puro Sangue. Then coming to the second question, I think that uh, different Ferrari for uh, different uh, Ferraristi or different Ferrari for different moments is uh, 
is the strategy where you can read the, the answers uh, to, to the first question. So we have been, uh, uh, we have on the market different uh, models. This has been uh, proving a successful strategy and uh, we don't see this risk of uh, cannibalization. Thank you, Benedetto. Thank you. <clears throat> and the last question for the moment comes from Evan Silverberg from Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead, sir. Hi, it's Adam Jonas from Morgan Stanley. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hello. Ciao, Jonas. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. So remind us of the technical production capacity uh, for the entire company, body shop, paint shop, post Puro Sangue. Uh, you referred to it earlier, but I, I didn't hear the exact number or range of units. 15,000. Adam, 15,000. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and, and just as a follow-up, um, the 250 new hires in Maranello and Modena, uh, where you referred to vertical integration of handcrafted components, that's a lot of employment. That's 5% 5, 5 of your company, uh, not insignificant. Can you tell us what kind of components and technologies that these talented and very lucky individuals will be working on? I know, I know you are curious and you would like to have an answer. I, I think that we will have the pleasure to meet in person uh, in a few weeks and we will tell you exactly what we want to do, <laughs> which are the strategic components we want to do uh, in-house. So bear with me if I ask you a little bit more patient. But uh, <laughs> sorry, okay. Adam, I, I know okay. I read all your report, I, I see, <laughs> but uh, allow us to wait still a few weeks, then we meet and we'll explain and we'll show you with a clear uh, presentation, I think, the, the, the strategic uh, part that we want to make here. Grazie. Prego, Adam. Arrivederci. Ciao. Ciao. Thank you very much. I'm showing no further questions at this time. I would now like to turn the conference back um, to Ben Nedetto. Thank you very much. Please go ahead. So I think uh, I want to thank uh, all, all of you for, uh, for your time, for, uh, for your attention this afternoon, and for all your questions. And also, this will be, believe me, this will be the last time I ask you to be patient, to have a lot of answers, because the next time we'll be in person, and I will, uh, together with the team, we will reply all the questions. So the first quarter, really, of this uh, we just closed, represent another uh, strong start. Uh, the metric, uh, as you see, as you have seen, uh, are uh, very good in all, uh, in all respect. And uh, the next, uh, in the Capital Market Day, we really want to outline our strategy for the year to come, and uh, we will take all your questions. And I really am very much looking forward to seeing you here in June in Maranello. So thank you again. Good afternoon, and uh, hope to see you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, you very much Mr. Vigneault. Mr. Vigneault. This now concludes the conference call. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.